we are all human and and some of us may be tougher than others or trained to be tougher in certain ways, but we're still human, right? We, we still have the same needs and, you know, we may deal with them differently or whatever the case may be, but but they do exist, right? And that's the hardest part when people are trained in toughness and identify that way. Often what that translates to is denial of one's own needs, which is different, right? If it's, we can still have needs yeah. and we, we address them if, you know, we can have both things at once, right? We can be tough and, and perseverant and resilient and all that and still acknowledge the needs inside of us, you know, without feeling ashamed that they're there because they're just human. How can I help? How can I be useful in ending needless suffering? Do not be afraid of work that has no end. We have to organize a social movement. We have an opportunity to lead by example versus just talking hot air. I think the more people in this fight, the more we grow. Eventually you could change. You know, the people are the ones that can make the change. Welcome back to Change Agents, an ironclad original, proudly presented by Montana Knife Company. And today, I don't know if it's safe to say this is my favorite topic, but I think it's one of the most important topics of the modern era, and that is mental health. I, I worry about people who suffer in silence because I believe that we are more similar than we are different. And if you get to a place where you think that you're alone and nobody might understand what you're going through, it can lead you down a very dangerous path. My guest today to help navigate this topic is Dr. Paul Conti. And you've probably heard of his name because he's been on some massive platforms recently. He is a psychiatrist PhD from Stanford University School of Medicine and is the former chief resident at the Harvard Medical School. He is the author of the best-selling book, Trauma, The Invisible Epidemic, which seeks to understand how trauma works and how we can heal from it. Some stats to prep you for the episode. According to the National Alliance on Mental Illnesses, up to one in five American adults have dealt with a mental health issue in the past year. And according to the John Hopkins Institute, one in four U.S. adults suffer from a diagnosable mental disorder in any given year. More than 8% of Americans have suffered from both a mental health disorder and a substance use disorder in the past year alone. Have you worked much with uh, military members, people in or post-military service? Not in a direct way. Like a, a significant part of my training was at the VA, the Palo Alto VA hospital. So, so there was, I mean, it was an interesting place at the time. It was, it was mostly older vets. There's some still some World War II, but a lot of Korea and Vietnam vets. And there, there weren't a lot of people after that. You know, they would kind of come and yeah. go. So I saw a, a, a lot through that, through the lens of those conflicts and the, and the impact they had on people. Um, uh, that's the only way it was formalized. You know, it was any formalized in any way. But I've had people over the year. I mean, certainly if you do this for 25 years, you see it in people in a lot of different ways. I mean, I met a doctor who was a, and she was a combat surgeon and she was in front of enemy lines. We talked about how, my God, she couldn't admit there was any, you know, there was anything other than toughness, you know, in her and is driving her into the ground. So it's like, it's just one example that comes to mind because I think we see similar things across people who are sort of trained for toughness. You know, like there's some parallel yeah. to sometimes what you'll see in doctors or, you know, people who are, who have another flavor of like, okay, you have to be tough. I mean, I think that militaries the strongest because right? it's such a direct message but i've had people who've, who've done undercover work and that, that's not acknowledged and they're coming back into the world so I, i've seen it from all you know from a lot of perspectives over the years you know toughness truly was the currency and if you look at the pipeline that i went through it's six months in the initial training pipeline it's a crucible and the curriculum is designed to find that low point they'll physically suppress you to a place where you start having very interesting conversations with yourself. Uh -huh, right. How much do I want this? Right. How much do I want to do this? Why do I want to do it? And the career is, you know, keep going, never quit. But the jury is kind of back with the results on a lifetime spent being tough and not dealing with those issues. Why do you think they don't talk about that other side of the coin of at some point in time, you have to release the stress valve. Otherwise, you're going to explode. Right. I think it's just too short term a perspective. I mean, if you think in the modern world, our horizons, so to speak, get shorter and shorter and shorter, right? And and you know, even think now, like a, a different example would be, 
you think about like businesses, right? And people, what's the bottom line this month? Or what's the bottom line this quarter, right? As opposed to like having some longer term view. And I think like, it's just one example of this human tendency, which is to see things in a very, in a myopic way. And while the short term is important, right? We, we prioritize that too much, like at the expense of the longer term. And I think this idea, maybe how we have in our society, like it's, it's never, it's never good to quit. It's never good to stop. Like we have to be tough. We have to keep going on. And look, I remember I was young. I mean, I, I think about it sometimes. I must have been like 11 or 12 years old or so. And, um, you know, at that time there'd be these like specials, right? It was just regular TV channels. And they get an eight o'clock special and it's like a big deal, right? And there was one about Mount Everest. And and it was about a particular expedition that had, that had gone up the mountain and a lot of people had died, right? And, and what I learned from that, even at that young age, it very clearly, I remember it very vividly, but like, it is not true that you should never stop or that you should never, quote unquote, quit, right? Or that what yeah. hurts us, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger, right? Like, all those things are not true. I mean, the lesson I took away is people who realized, hey, something has changed here, right? This is not, we thought this is harder than we thought it was going to be. It's more risky. Like, those people who saw that and stopped or quit, quote unquote, lived. Right. They know the next day, oh, the weather's better. And they summit the mountain. The people who wouldn't quit, who kept going, died. Right. And and so like there is a long term view. And 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 I think in intense situations, you can see why the focus is on the short term. Right. Because there's like something that, that, want, that we want to do right now or an ethic we want us to have inside. But I do think we could balance that. I mean, if, if, if you know, if you're in the field, right, then and I think there, there are times when you have to keep going. Right. I mean, you have to do like what you're trained. Like, that's why you're trained that way. Right. It's very, very daunting yep. and it seems hopeless and you have to go on anyway. Right. Like that's true. But you can have that and have that very strongly reinforced. Right. While also having a perspective that says this isn't talking about your whole life. You're like, this is right now that you have to do this. Right. But but there, but then when, on the other side of that, you can take a broader perspective of self that might say, is this way of living good for me? Is this working well for me? Have I. If I'm here, just for example, because I what what like a thing that's not uncommon and must be familiar to you is the idea of how I'm here because of my of duty in some in some way, right? This strong sense inside of me, have I fulfilled that? Right? Because it, when we're when we do things in part from a sense of duty, then it's very hard to tell when we've inside when we've done what it is to, enough to make our, ourselves feel good about ourselves. You know? Like I you know, yeah. I didn't like uh, hospital medicine was difficult and long hours and unpredictable and it felt very much like abuse you know you're, you're you know your eight hour a day job is now 12 or 13 and you know and i think i don't want to do this anymore you know but i thought try to feel guilty about that right because i'm trained as a doctor i should be in the hospitals right and i had to really through therapy come to terms with like hey you did a lot of that right and like whatever your duty was to, to do that like you've discharged and now you have to take care of yourself you know, now for me, there was a shift, you know, I'm 55, but I have young kids, you know, my, my oldest is, is going to turn 10 in a couple of weeks, right? So I thought, hey, you know what, there's a higher power to serve here, right? It's not my, my duty as a physician is second to my duty as a parent, right? And I think, you know, this is why when people are very, very strongly trained in the way that, you know, what you had told me earlier, right? So you have all the training for toughness, right? And, and for perseverance and resilience, and you can do that in spades, right? But but it doesn't prepare you for personal life things that where we have so much less control, you know, and, and this idea that we are supposed to control everything is what leads us to sometimes have a lot more trouble in our personal life. But right? because like there's there's not as much control as there is out in our professional lives, right, especially competent people and what they choose. So it, it, it becomes harder. And I think that's why a lot of those people died on Mount Everest and continue to right. The, the story is the same. Right. Where yeah. we're like, no, we have to go on. I'm trained to go on. I'm, this is what I do is go on. And the thought is maybe sometimes, but, but like they're very, very rare times. Right. They're like, you must now go on. Like I would measure a combat situation. I, I wrote my first book about my, my uncle, you know, who is in World War II. And when, you know, when all the officers had been killed, he needed to lead, lead the men out. And like there was no choice. So it was good. He was trained in and he had it naturally in him to do all of those things. But when he was on the other side, he thought, this is, I want to go home. I want to live a good life. I want to live a peaceful life, right? So, so, and even, you know, he had a sixth grade education, my, my uncle Rango, but he understood 
when it was time to do what you had to do, there was no alternative, right? Then you do that. And, you, and I'm trained to do that. I know how to do that, right? But I'm judicious about when I do that. And, and he didn't want that anymore. You know, it took too much of a toll on him. So does that, I know so I'm talking at your love. Does that make sense? No, it makes sense. And honestly, in your description, you described the internal battle that I went through coming to the decision that I needed to end my marriage of almost 20 years. Uh, it was my choice to end it. Um, and I always just speak broadly about it because my ex-wife doesn't have a platform. But I think what it's safe to say is that her and I both agree that it was for the right reasons, but it probably should have happened a decade before. Right. That never quit attitude will allow you to do things that people will scratch their head and not understand how you did it. But it's a double edged sword that can keep you in things that you should, you know, unhealthy, toxic relationships or alcohol or substance abuse. Those are things you probably should quit. And right. I watch a community of people who, again, the, the only equity is you can never quit. And so regardless of what you're you're smashing your hand with a hammer and I'm just going to keep going day after day after day. Well, pretty soon your hands pulverized and then you're just working your way up your arm. And I don't right. think that's what that tool is designed for. Right. Because because what doesn't kill us? Imagine that metaphor where you're hitting yourself in the hand with a hammer. Right. And now it's moving yeah. up. You're like, that's really bad for you. Right. I mean, it's bad for anything. It looks good on a fortune cookie. It's great fortune cookie wisdom. I think it fails the crucible of real life. Right, right, absolutely. It fails the crucible of real life because what doesn't hurt us then is making us weaker. If I'm trying to get through life in whatever way, and I metaphorically or really have a smashed hand, I'm now at a big disadvantage. What didn't kill me has made me more likely to be killed. Right. So, yeah. so we have to stop and think. When, when do we, when do we stop? When do we take care of ourselves? And look, this is not often a problem in a person who doesn't have a lot of distress tolerance doesn't have a lot of resilience i mean i see all the time given that my my work is selected for people who are who are much who are high achieving in this stage of my career so i see a lot more of this where what am i seeing people who are high achieving they're people with great distress tolerance right think about that like being on mount everest nobody is like are you going to make it to the top or are you risking your life unless you're great at mountain climbing right that's why you're on everest right so, so yeah. you have to have perseverance, resilience, distress tolerance. That's exactly the person who's likely not to understand, right? When, when too much is too much and it's not going to be okay, right? So it's always the, the person who has the distress tolerance, you know, the, the surgeon, you know, who is able to work 36 hour shifts for seven years in training, right? The military person who's selected for the, the highest level of, intensity and risk in operations, right? There's just two examples of like, of course it's those people there, just like the mountain climbing, right? right? Example. So you have people who are built to not see at the margin, right? To like to have a default of keep going, keep going, keep going. And then we have to be able to work against our own internal predispositions, right? It's like saying, imagine if like you're going to ask Usain Bolt to run not a hundred meters, but to start, like he's going to run 100 meters, like he's racing 100 meters, but then you're going to tell him when to stop. So, like, you know, he's going to be at the 40 meter mark, you're like, stop at 50, right? Or stop at 46. It's not going to do it, right? I mean, the, the, he's running at full steam and full throttle. You know, if you're running like that, you don't, you can't just stop on a dime, right? Which yeah. is why it's natural when someone's running like that, whether it's, you know, it's in the military, it's mountain climb, whatever it may be, that person's running like that. That's how they're there. They're not just likely to run up. Oh, I should stop now at this point on the mountain, right? This Or at this point in my career, right? I should stop and attend to other things. That's it, precisely the person who's not going to see that. So every good quality has its downside. I mean, every everything does, right? So we look at that and say, distress tolerance, perseverance, resilience, internal strength. These are great things, right? But they'll work against us like any other good quality, right? Unless we're, be, we're where? And we say, look, where, where does this stop? Like, you know, this is a great thing I have in me, but I gotta, I have to manage it now. It's incumbent upon me to understand it and to have better control of it or that it, that advantage that I have will hurt me. Easier said than done, speaking from my own personal yeah. experience. Look, uh, yeah. Oftentimes we don't do it until until we get hurt, right? Yeah, until you fall apart. Right, and, right. And, then, and then we realize like, oh, I, you know, I am human, right? And I see a lot of that too, where a person is confronted with their humanity, right? That they do have limits, right? And that's a very big, like what gets called, it's an ego injury, 
right? Like if somewhere in your head is that you should always, 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 always keep going, no matter what, that's not true of any human being. When you find that it's not true for you either, it seems very personal. What is wrong with me, right? I, I'm I'm a failure compared to who I thought I was, like those those kind of thoughts, right? So it all has to be grounded in we are all human, right? We have 24 hours in our day. We have, we have so much energy in us. Even the most energetic and robust of us is going to have limits, right? And like, that's okay. So see, we start at everyone has a right to be human. Now within there, there are going to be those of us who can do more and those of us who can do less. Fine. If we're the people who can do more and have more within us, right, to, to push forward, we have a greater responsibility to 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 monitor ourselves more more carefully to understand ourselves better that's you know, that's the responsibility to self and to others right how are we going to take care of other people that we we love right and we want to take care of if we're not taking care of ourselves I mean, it seems so simple but it's like the you know the, the oxygen mask on the airplane right the oxygen mask comes down put yours on first right it's, it, it feels like that's not because everybody's supposed to be selfish because if you don't then you pass out and you're not going to put it on the kid right so yeah. so like it really is true that We've got to look at ourselves and often that's the self-enforced blind spot. Like my own humanness and whatever fragility they're in me is the one thing I'm not going to look at. Right. And people will say this. I'll see someone who they have a car and they get the car maintenance relatively regularly. Right. They're not just driving the car until it breaks or the wheel falls over. Like, yeah, they t I take care of my car. Sure I do. They will say, yeah, I get it maintained because like my family's in, my kids are in it. Right. Okay. That's how you're treating a mechanized thing. But you. Don't, don't get that treatment. Like, it doesn't matter if you get enough sleep. You just keep going and keep going because you have to and you should. So we'll treat we'll treat things much, much better than we'll treat ourselves because we understand that things can break. But we often don't understand that we, although not a thing, can break too. <laughs> yeah, as you're feeling it. I actually use that exact same analogy when I'm talking about mental health. Like, you know, it's okay to go uh, crack the hood open on your car before smoke is billowing out from underneath it. Maybe have a, an expert get in there, peek around a little bit. Maybe they know a little bit more about, like myself, I love driving cars. I couldn't put an engine together for, if my life depended on it. Why would I not go talk to an expert and say, hey, how's it looking down here? Right, there's only one reason. And the reason is shame, right? If, it was, hmm. if you felt it was shameful to look under the, somehow opening the car hood is so shameful. Right? If, that were, if you felt that inside, that would be the reason you wouldn't do it. Right? You wouldn't go in there and look. You wouldn't go go talk to an expert. It's it's the shame that we generate within ourselves that that keeps us from health so so often. That you know, looking at oneself and one's own uh, humanness and fragility is shameful. It's not shameful to do it for the car, right? But it's shameful do think, to do it do for the self, and then that's what keeps us away from from, hmm. from taking care of ourselves. I hope you are enjoying season two of Change Agents, which is an ironclad original. And if you are a fan of the podcast, you know that we are presented by Montana Knife Company, which from where I'm sitting right now is a short two hour drive, maybe 120 miles due south towards Missoula. I was first exposed to this brand through its founder, Josh Smith. Um, and actually when I first met him, I wasn't even aware of what Montana Knife Company was. He sat across the table for me. We had a conversation. And I have been a fan ever since. This was a few years ago, and the velocity and trajectory of that company is unbelievable. I directly associate that growth with who Josh is, what he stands for, and what he puts into his product. So a little bit more about Josh. He's been making knives for 30 years. They're made in the USA. They have a multi-generational warranty and free sharpening. They're design tested and they're built by hunters and MKC's a hunting knife company first and foremost. They sell out their knives, sometimes in under 60 seconds. Uh, and if you wanna see what they have available or what's coming up, surf over to montananifecompany.com. They have a new knife drop every Thursday at 7 p.m. Here's what I'm gonna say on that. Practice checking out. As ridiculous as that sounds, you need to have your credit card information loaded and practice the checkout process because they go like that. I cannot even count the number of times I have had a knife taken from my cart because somebody was faster to purchase it than I was. People ask me all the time, what's my favorite blade of theirs? I go with the Mini Speed Go. It is my everyday carry knife. I don't use it for knife fighting. I use it for things that I need a knife for. So usually opening boxes. But it is my favorite blade. And if you're a fan of working knives made for working people, I highly suggest that you check out Montana Knife Company. And I'm gonna add to that. Let's talk a little bit about the warranty. 
They had the best warranty program in the industry. No matter if you bought the knife from them directly or bought the knife from a friend or it was gifted to you or if you even found the knife, they're going to honor the warranty for the life of the blade. How awesome is that? Couldn't be more proud to have them as the presenting sponsor of Change Agents. They are a fantastic organization. You think that shame comes from worrying about what other people may think or thinking that you are alone struggling with what it is that you're struggling with while everybody else is just living their best life? Sure. So that's what a lot of what goes on in in for example, in team building situations, right? Is that everyone is is trained to think well, like we're all here to keep doing this thing that we're doing, right? And and we, we have to keep doing it. Doing it. Okay. So the no one's really acknowledging like they're run down, they're scared. You know, they can't because they feel like that's not what we can't do that, right? I have to hang together with the team. Right. And then what you'll see sometimes, I see this all the time where let's say you have a team of them to make it up six people. Right. And then, and if you ask all six on the outside, they'll say, everyone else, look, look up. Everyone else is doing great. It's me who's not. Why? Because mm -hmm. everyone else looks great on the surface. Right. What they're showing to everyone else. But guess what? That this person does too. Right. So you could ask all six people. And so then you'll get the answer that everyone's doing okay because they seem to be doing okay, except me. Because even though I seem to be doing okay, I know something different inside. Now, if you get all six people talking about it together, they all share the same truth and they strengthen one another. Like it never happens that in a situation like that, you get all six people together and you, you share with them that hey, everyone's kind of struggling in their own ways. And then they all get like weak and lazy and they don't try anymore or they fall apart. No, they get, they get healthier. Right. And th that's why a lot of what happens these days is acknowledging these things where instead of like, just don't talk about it. Right. For example, if we shut it down, it'll, shut it, put it in the back. It'll, it'll be okay. As you, as you said earlier, that's not true. Right. Yeah, so now okay we, we can try and build teams and also acknowledge the humanness. So we can build perseverance and the gumption within us and the strength of self. We can do that without crossing a line where we're pretending we're buying into something that's kind of a mass delusion that like, yeah, everyone, everyone is like a machine that doesn't break or doesn't run out. That's what we're going to be. Right. And it's like, that's not true. And when we acknowledge our humanness as we're striving for strength, we do better. Where did your journey and uh, desire to practice in the mental health space come from? Well, I, I had a career after college. You know, I had a, a business career. I worked for a consulting firm. And, and there was a lot that I liked about that. There was a lot that I liked. Um, there were things I didn't. You know, I wanted more direct contact with people. And I wanted to just know more about how the how humans work. You know, I didn't know anything. Like, I don't know anything about cars, and I'd like to, but not enough that I'm going to go do that, apparently. But I, but mm -hmm. I didn't know about how people function, and I did want to understand more. Um, so I had all of this inside of me, but I felt like I couldn't go do it. Like I was around 24, but when I was in my mid 20s, and to go change careers, I thought was I have to go back to college and take a year of science. I didn't have any science, so I'm gonna it's, I'm gonna leave a job that's a pretty good job. I'm gonna pay for a year right of school again, and then I won't really make a good salary for like another nine years. Right. And it seemed like, oh, how could I do that? Like, I didn't understand. Of course I could do that. Like I was I was healthy and and like I had the wherewithal in me to do it. Right. It, it wasn't that I couldn't do it. It was that I was so afraid and ashamed. Oh, I'm going to change career paths. What will people think? And sure enough, when I did leave, people did say that, like, oh, my gosh, you you must be crazy. Right. You're not going to make any money for 10 years. Right. But like, it's OK. Right. I'm still here. Right. I survived without making much money for 10 years. Right. But but I didn't understand that. And it was the environment I was living in where people were like, oh, my God, how could you do that? Right. But here's the truth of it. Once I had, once I was doing it and I was leaving, it wasn't that I was leaving for medical school. It was that I was leaving to do something I really wanted to do against some of this imposed shame that people started to ask me, how are you doing that? I want to do that, too. Mm -hmm. I want another job. I want another career. I want to work less. So 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 I was right about how the environment reacted to me. What I didn't understand at the time is that we were all acting in a way that was false, right? Like this is the greatest thing to do and we have to keep doing it and it's successful, right? And we're being successful and we're working hard. Like we can't stop it when many, many, many of us wanted to stop it. Like, so so this was all swirling around inside of me. And then after the loss of my brother to suicide, that, that you know, it was, a, I mean, it just brought everything to a head for me. And that's when I, I realized, hey, 
it's not that you're so old, you're 20 something and you can't do anything now. It's that you're only 20 something. Like, just go do that thing you want to do, right? Go work at that. Don't think, oh, I'm not going to make a good income for 10 years. Think I I'm going to choose what I do tomorrow. And that's got to make tomorrow. Okay. Whether I make an income or not. Right. And it's, yeah. it's that, that, that you know, led me to reassess everything from a very different perspective. It brought it all to a head and gave me the internal clarity to see what was true that I couldn't see before that loss. I'm very sorry to hear about your brother. I wasn't aware of that. I, uh, I come from a community of people where I don't want to say it's an epidemic of suicide because it's not, but I will say that it is statistically above the norm in many other communities, but probably similar to first responder. And it's a, it's a, a topic that I have talked about with many of, uh, previous people that I serve with, and I've yet to be able to come to any level of understanding why it is so much higher um, in the community of people that I used to work with, unless it has something to do with the isolation or, like you mentioned, the shame or the unwillingness of wanting to share or reach out because of how people may view it. Um, and it's led me to deeper questions along the way, and I'd be curious your thoughts on this. You know, a lot of times when people look at veteran suicide, they only look at what happened in service and um, things they might have been exposed to in the service. Right. And what I didn't realize until recently in having conversations with people that I used to work with, because we never used to sit around and be like, oh, hey, tell me about your childhood. Right. You know, like, oh, you know, we never talked about what happened before the military. Right. And so somebody who kills themselves after they serve in the military, of course, horrible loss of life. And it has just such profound impact on the family. But I wonder if people... What I've noticed, and I'd be curious your thoughts on this, I have actually found that a large percentage of people that I used to work with actually came from traumatic backgrounds and upbringings. And I'm curious if the job was more enticing to them because of that, because they could do something with that trauma or was a way for them to not pass it along. And then you still have to deal with it at the end, right? So there's this bridge of in between where you had this occupation you're still left with the before trauma and then the after. Right. I don't know. It, to me, and again, I'm just I'm kind of just thinking in real time, but it to me, the veteran suicide issue is much more, it's deeper than just what happened in service. And that seems to be what people are focusing on. I'm just curious your thoughts. If to people, would you ever see a connection from somebody who comes from a traumatic background looking for a job or wanting to be more enticed by a job in that special operations community because of, it, because of sure. what they do? Yeah, I, I Absolutely yes, absolutely yes, and 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 I'll say I think when it comes to mental health, the basic concepts are almost always simple. The devil's in the details, right? It's 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 the it's the part of really understanding it that's that's complex. But usually, if we look for what's what's the simple premise that's telling us what to anchor ourselves to, and and I think what you're describing uh, links to two factors. And I think this is true of, of anything that really, really pushes a person, right? So, so during the military, special forces really pushing a person, right? But, but same in many ways is true to people who go into healthcare, right? You know, if someone's going to go to medical school is understands they're pushing themselves, right? There's there's a selection for people. Same thing with with mountain climbers. Same thing in many ways with first responders. I mean, you know, there, there are jobs that pay the same amount of money and don't involve showing up on the scene when someone's been shot right so why yep. show up on the scene when someone has been shot why why do the things that we're talking about there's a pushing of self someone says i want to help people i want to protect people right and i see that in order to do that in the way maybe i, I want to do it you you have to really push yourself right so now there's an alliance between i want to do good in the world and i want to push i'm going to push myself right and a lot of the reasons people push themselves is to try and feel good enough Right? The, the suicide rates in in physicians are, are higher too, for example, because mm -hmm. you're, we're talking about the same characteristics in people across these disciplines, right? Which is uh, which is there's something going on inside of me, and I mean it's not always this, but but it's predisposed. It selects for people who want to overcome something. I'll feel good enough when I have that medical degree. I'll feel good enough when I've been able to save X number of people when I. So many people, when I go out in the ambulance, right, to see them, I'll feel good enough when I protected people by, you know, doing some dangerous military exercise, right? Like, it's all, it makes sense, right? But 
there's something to prove to the self as well, which not always, but but very often goes back to childhood trauma. So when you say these things, my brain goes, of course, right? Because trauma early on in life affects us the most, right? So no one's joining the military before age 15, right? So, so right, 18, that's when yeah, most no, of the trauma yeah. is occurring that's, that's setting the stage for what happens afterward. So if you look at why is this person having troubles, right? Or, or why is it may this person have trouble, right? Whether, again, I, I'm just making the parallel of, of like extreme sports, military, medicine, or in, in any of these situations, you know, you, you have to go look at the selection bias for people that have been through some childhood trauma in those formative years, single digit years up until mid teens, right? That, that, that makes that person want to go out and prove something to themselves. And that person is going to push themselves farther, right? They're going to be able to achieve a lot, but they're also much more likely to not know, like, when should I feel good enough and when should I feel ashamed, right? And that's why you see people who say, want to make money to protect other people. Mm -hmm. And now they've made vast amounts of money and it doesn't feel good like enough, right? Because if you don't go back and look at yourself to, you know, enough is never enough, Right. Because it because you don't go back to what the original problem first can identify. You know, my issue has been, for example, lack of resources when I was growing up. And I want to, I, I wanted to earn money to protect people. It was just one example. That person's got to go look at where that came from and how they change things for other people. Otherwise, it's stuffed in the background. Too much is never enough. Person has vast amounts of money, loses a little bit of it and feels like a failure. Right. So it's a selection yeah. bias. And then also the training systems, as we just talked about, train us to shove down things. Nobody wants to hear that, right? Nobody wants to hear the doctor or the special forces person, right? Say like, hey, I'm feeling really sad and down or hurt. Like it was hard what I saw. Like the people just keep put your head down and keep doing your job. Like that's precisely what gets us into, into trouble. Yeah. And then you lose that job. I mean, there are, there are a few instances that I know of from the SEAL community where people took their life while they were active, but the vast majority are shortly after. Yes. And it seems, you know, they lose that tool, that mechanism for whatever it was, the ability to do good, the ability to turn their anger towards what they would perceive right. as the same type of trauma that they were receiving. They lose it. They lose the community. Oftentimes they isolate. If I'm being totally honest, there's oftentimes, uh, you know, substance abuse issues associated with that, most commonly alcohol and it's within a few years of them getting out, they either drink themselves to death or more often than not, they make a poor decision about taking their life under the influence of alcohol. And it's just, it has repeated itself so many times. And I, and I don't know if you can, I don't know if there's a solution to the problem, but I, I think that focusing only on what happened in the military is maybe half of the issue. I think we have to start looking at what brings people or what causes them to want to do that job in the first place. Absolutely. Absolutely. That other part of it can't be less than half. Right, because yeah. so, it's so important uh, what how what the the sense of self that we form, you know, in, in those formative years, um, what are what we are perceived weaknesses are, how we're trying to overcome them. I mean, it's so important the traumas that we carry with us, things that trigger shame, things that trigger I'm not good enough. Right, so that that has to be at least half of the story. You know, even though there, there may be a lot of of tribulation and trauma while in the military. It can't be that the stuff that came before it is is even less than half. I mean, it just sets the stage for all the other things that come inside of us. And and there are ways. There are ways to prevent. I mean, we can't prevent every suicide, but could we prevent a lot of them? I, my thought about that is, how can the answer not be yes, right? I think about some of what you're saying is so the person leaves the military and then they don't have that team, the group of people, the sense of self, they're doing something good. Absolutely. All of that is true. Of course, all that is true. And also part of the problem is just that they have time, right? This is the same reason it maps to like when people have panic attacks, so many times a person will say, you know, I can't believe it, or I'm surprised. Then they say something that's not surprising when you know, which is they didn't have a panic attack when they were really stressed about something. They didn't have a panic attack during the work day. They didn't have a panic attack while they were juggling those seven things while they were in the risky situation, right? They have it when they sit down at the end of the day, like, ah, oh, I can finally take a deep breath. Sure, because there's, I think how simple it is, there's space in the brain for it. You're juggling. And the tsunami comes. Right, right. It, or like, there, um, you know, nature doesn't like a vacuum. So if now there's a vacuum in your head, because you're not thinking of eight things at once, 
right? And now you, you just have that, that peace inside. It's not good if there are difficult things waiting to run into the peace. That's what causes the panic attack, or that's part of why it's very, very predictable that after people leave the military, they, all the things that you said and this other huge factor of there's just time and space in here for all the things that have been pushed out of consciousness to come to come back in and just a rational understanding of what happens in people right? and, and, the, and providing real support. You know, it's why like peer support, right? When, when someone in the profession, there's someone who's gone through it, tells that person they don't have to be ashamed. It's way, way, way more powerful, right? When I can t talk to a physician about, you know, it, you don't have to be ashamed because you, know, you saw some awful things and you had difficult things in childhood and, and you developed an alcohol problem, but you want to get over this and go back to your job, right? Or you developed an alcohol problem and, and you can't go back to your job. And we're trying to, how do you have a good life anyway? Like, whatever it may be, we have to start with letting that person not feel ashamed, right? What you're doing yeah. is hard. I've been through my own troubles. I understand where you've been and you can relate to me and me to you and I get it and I've had my own issues. Right. I mean, people respond so strongly to that because that's that's the best way to relieve shame. I mean, what if we did that? We was every single person coming out of the special forces is at dramatically elevated risk. And I don't know all the numbers, but the risk is dramatically elevated. That much we know. Yeah. So what if we none of them are good? Out? Yeah. Hmm? So yeah, none of the numbers are good. I don't know how them precisely either, but they're all they're a hockey stick in comparison. Right. So think about we don't need to have right because we know the only thing we need to know the risk is way too high, right? So, so we can respond to that and say, we can manage this risk. We can put like peer support systems, you know, treaters, people to evaluate that don't make people ashamed to go in and see you. It's like a network of you. Like you see how this could be so much better. And you make, you make connection because, you know, when people are in team settings, they, they do what's called an affiliative defense, right? Which isn't just, I feel more safe because you're there. And I know that you're competent and this and that. It's 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 that, but it's more than that. I just feel safer because I'm part of something. Right. And I and I feel also more validated that I'm part if that if that something goes away, now I'm not part of the team anymore. I don't have what's called the affiliative defense. Now I'm alone with the pain or the stressors where I just felt safer just because I was part of that team, even if no one is around me at the moment. Right. So we need to maintain some of that team setting like there's there could still, why can't there be teams of people supporting one another people who are more senior been through how hard it is to come out and reintegrate why can't we still have that you know a team kind of setting and maybe there's professionals and personal support people and peers why can't we have it when people come out so we say hey that's obvious right there's something really important you're losing which is how busy things have been up in here and that you're part of a team let's address both of those things you know, now we start going a long way towards prevention just simply by doing that, you know? It's not that complicated. Yeah. We just often don't do it. We don't step back and we look at the systems and say, where where are the risks in these systems? How do we change them? And when we do, a lot of times there are very there are clear answers on how to make things better. I hadn't thought about the ad additional time that you have. Like you said, the panic attack doesn't occur in the moment because you're so task-saturated just – plugging your fingers in the dam metaphorically right. and then you sit back and you know on a lounge chair and then this tsunami of all the things overwhelm you yeah and unfortunately it seems to be within i'd say and this is anecdotally but about one to three years mm -hmm. of separation from service is when that time it really starts to rise to that higher risk category well probably it's probably i'm gonna i'm gonna think the risk and the potential for harm starts almost immediately Right. It's just that by the hmm. time it's rising, you know, you're seeing in the one to three year range, the consequences of things that were developed in that first year and then progressed in the one to three year range. You know, there, there, there are things where prevention yeah. is involves rapid access. Like this is the kind of thing where clearly if, if, we, if we wanted effective preventive medicines, we would be talking to people about this well before they leave the military. And we'd be talking about when does the risk come at moment one? I mean, when I've worked with people who are going through very, very difficult things, like it's an example recently of someone who went through the protract, protracted death of a loved one, right? And, and there was a lot of grief and a, a lot of, uh, a just a lot of hard feelings in the context of a lot of pulling for attention, right? All the time, there are things to do and go see the person, try and work things out. And this was so stressful for the person involved. Then the, the loved one passes away, right? And there's a sense of relief. We, we knew the person was terminally ill. 
They're like, oh, mm -hmm. okay, now this person can can like be okay and get some rest. No, that's the point when I become more worried. Now that person is going to sit, let, you know, metaphorically sit down on the couch and exhale, and then everything rushing through all that pain and fear and distress is going to come to them. So, you know, we we tend to be least worried when we should be most worried. And I would be telling people that the extra risk that like we can look at the numbers and say you are at higher risk for really difficult things happening in life, right? Like addiction, right? For example, like depression, right? And and things that can end life like suicide, right? Th that's the truth. The numbers tell us that. So let's start preventing now because the risk to you starts clicking away moment one when you go. So let's decrease that risk now because one, you don't have to be one of those statistics. And actually, if we do this enough, we can change what those statistics are. Yeah. I agree with you. I can't speak to, I've been out of the military for 10 years, so I can't speak to any changes that have occurred since that time. But let's just say the exit mechanism that I had was the opposite of what you described. Like, right. Bon voyage, pick up your DD-214 on the way out, and uh, best of luck. <laughs> yeah, right. right. And, and I think we have an obligation when people do things that serve the rest of us. And, and, and really, anyone who's helping someone else is serving other people. Like think about the, the the paramedic, the EMT, could make as much money without putting the person's physical and mental health at risk. Right? Th there's someone who's doing something that takes care of the rest of us because you or I or anybody else might need an EMT in two minutes. Right? Yep. So we have an obligation to take care of people like that in society, but we don't. We we don't we just don't do it. And and if you think here, how are we not taking better care of people? Who are literally putting their lives at risk for us right both when the lives are actually on the line in the moment and then all the things that are inside of people that put them at risk after the fact like how do we not do a better job for people that are protecting you know our, our literally our safety like I, I find that i'm not trying to be critical of, of like even specifically the military or this or that i think it's us as a society that it's it's egregious the same way you know we didn't attend to the health of nurses after the pandemic I was like, well, gosh, that was really awful. Now go back to work as usual. They were overwhelmed before, you know, that what yeah. the years of, of horror, right, that, that went on. But, you know, it's easy to say, oh, it's back to business as usual. Just like, you know, okay, bye-bye. You're on your way out now and good luck. I mean, we have an obligation as a society to take care of people more than this. I mean, I, I, I think it is shameful that it is shameful. Sometimes shame is there for a reason, right? And I think as a society that we wouldn't invest more, it makes makes just no sense to me. It's that short-term view again, right? And and it's a short-term view infused with, with just a reflexive selfishness, right? As a society, our priorities are not in a great place and we don't take care of people who take care of us the way we should. Yeah, I would say most people, regardless of taking care of others, I think are struggling to take care of themselves. I'm curious along that vein as well, what would you say your broad or baseline definition of good mental health yeah. is? Yeah, and by the way, so I want to add one thing in. You said people who are taking care of others, right? And then taking care of themselves. The people who are taking care of others are less likely to take care of themselves. That's part of the yeah. selection. I mean, it's part of why they're taking care of others. And not that everyone has a blind spot around self-care, but of course you see that. Right. That's why people can be getting worse. They kind of know they're getting depressed. They know they're developing a substance issue. They don't tell anyone. Right? They're much better at taking care of others. And, and then they're rationalizing about themselves until they're in too much trouble. So, yes, the person taking care of others is the most likely to to, like, to shortchange the taking care of, of self. And then I think you know, good mental health looks like curiosity about ourselves, inquiring about ourselves. Like a, a lot of what I've tried to do recently is talk about this in in broader perspectives of not looking at mental health as oh like it's a problem right like we all have mental health right like we're all thinking right we're all feeling so what if we look at mental health in a way that's very different from how modern medicine has looked at mental health which i think is wildly dumbed down and 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 inefficient and ineffective what is it look we all have mental health right let's try and understand what that means and 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 know what the pitfalls are potentially and, and really look right at them and talk about things that we can do. So what are the pitfalls? People don't get help because they feel ashamed of needing help. We should talk to everyone 
about this, right? People who have more distress tolerance and ability to persevere are more likely to push themselves too far. Let's talk about that too, right? Childhood things that we may think we've overcome, right? We've overcome because we're checking the box that, that makes us think we've overcome it. That's not how we overcome it, right? So do you think about these basic principles, right? The role of shame in us hiding from ourselves and then we start this downward spiral. What about even having curiosity about like, what's going on inside of me? You know, when things are quiet, if I'm in the shower, I'm in the car and no one's there, you know, there's, the, the radio's not on, what do I say to myself inside? Right? What's my narrative? What do I think about myself? Like, we don't, we, we hide these things from ourselves. And I think the things I'm saying now are so basic that I, I, I believe this, that we should be teaching age appropriate, of course, aspects of this in elementary school. Yeah. But we don't, right? I, I, I became very upset, and this is really true, when I was a second year psychiatry resident, so I finished medical school, I'm a doctor, and I'm in my second year of training. So, I, so I've gone through the, a lot of the most intense in the hospital. I'm really learning something about psychiatry. And, and I kept seeing, oh my God, I'm learning things now, two years after graduating from medical school that I and everyone else should have started learning in elementary school. But what's going on inside of us and how do we, how we fail ourselves over time, even the idea of like bullies, we talk about people bullying people, but we don't talk about what's going on inside the person who's bullying, right? Yeah. We don't talk to the bully about what makes somebody want to thump somebody just because they're smaller than them, right? They feel, person feels less than and feels hurt by something. What is that? Right? Can we look at the whole system, right? And then say, it's not like we're saying the bullying is okay. We're, we're not saying that, right? But we want the person being bullied to understand this isn't about you, except that it's hurting you, right? It's that, that person needs to hurt somebody. Right. So that person has their own issues and, and like we need to go look at those and attend to those issues. So that bully on the playground doesn't become the bully, you know, out in the world in ways that that are can be much, much worse. Right. The thief, yeah. you know, the person who's who's really hurting people in organized ways. Let's look at this when the person is a child. Right. They can have a better life. It's safer for everyone else. So we help the bullied person see that it's not them. It's a problem in the other. So. We're helping them work against shame. And it's natural. If someone bullies you, you feel less than and weird. Let's talk about what that is. We protect the bully. Then let's go look at what's going on in the bully. We, we don't necessarily do these things because we're not educating ourselves, right? We, if we don't educate ourselves, we can't educate the kids, right? Then we have a situation where that same bully, when, when the person was 12 years old, is the same bully at 72, right? You yeah. know, has a, by and large a miserable life, bullying people around them. And it's been harmful to other people and it didn't have to be that way. So, so we, we need to start understanding the basic premises of curiosity about ourselves, what's going on inside of us when we're younger. And, and so I'm trying to bring that message now. Like, let's all understand that now, right? Because that'll help us take care of ourselves and it'll help us be better for the people that we're taking care of. People that are younger than us, whether it's someone coming out of the military, you can help now, or it's a child, right? There, there's so much we can do for others when we understand better. Ladies and gentlemen, today's episode is also brought to you by Mountain Tough. It's a unique functional fitness program that is, of course, supported by hunters and seals and rangers and those from the special operations community. But that is not my favorite part of the Mountain Tough system or program. Although it was developed with insights from the backcountry hunter and veteran special operations community, there is an emphasis on more than just physical strength, which I believe to be essential. It is also about building an unbreakable mind. It is easy to build muscles from the neck down. It is far more difficult to build muscles from the neck up and the resilience between your ears. The Mountain Tough app provides the best functional fitness program directly to your phone, tablet, TV, or a web browser. So you really don't have an excuse to say, oh, I didn't know what I could be doing or should be doing, whether it's a program or inspiration or insight. It's all right there at the touch of your fingers. Some of you might be saying, well, I'm not a ex special operations personnel. Uh, I'm also not a backcountry hunter. That's okay. For those of you who might not start out as an elite athlete, but you want to improve wherever you may be, Mountain Tough is determined to push everybody's limits. And they're gonna meet you where you are with thoughtful programming, helping you achieve elite status through progressive fitness, focusing on longevity, injury prevention, and holistic development. It's a story arc from wherever you are getting as close to elite as could possibly be. So what are you waiting for? You can join the global Mountain Tough community right now. A community of people transforming their lives, bodies, and minds. 
Download the Mountain Tup app today and start training to always be ready for whatever it is you're trying to be ready for, for the backcountry, for the mission, or just life's unexpected challenges. Because when it comes to being prepared, there's no excuse to not start now. You can use the code CHANGE, which I'm looking at all capital letters, one word, at mountaintough.com on the monthly plan to get your first month absolutely free after your 14-day free trial. That's six weeks free to dive in, test the waters, the programming, and make sure it's actually for you. What are you waiting for? You can change your life today. Be ready for the mountains, the mission, and just life in general. Ladies and gentlemen, Four Branches Bourbon is the only spirits company founded by veterans from the Army, Navy, Marines, and Air Force. These veterans collaborated with a Bourbon Hall of Fame master distiller and legend to help them make their smooth but complex blend of four grain and 96 proof bourbon blended and bottled in Bardstown, Kentucky. It is often said that bourbon without a story is just brown water, and this bourbon has a story with over a hundred combined years of military service around the world. At Four Branches, they are not just crafting some of the finest bourbon, but they are reshaping the drinking narrative. Their motto, drink honorably, embodies their ethos of sipping to remember, not to forget. And as veterans, we get to come home while others did not. So if you're gonna drink, please drink honorably, and don't drink to forget but let's sip to remember. And if you are going to sip and you like bourbon, this has a very interesting taste. Not that I'm a bourbon connoisseur or expert, but smoother than I thought it would be. I've had some bourbons that about ripped my face off. This was the exact opposite. So please enjoy honorably. If you want to learn more about Four Branches, please check out their story at fourbranches.com and pick up a bottle of their fine bourbon today using the code IRONCLAD10. That is all one word, iron, normal spelling, C-L-A-D-10, you're going to get 10% off. For people listening who have either not really thought much about their mental health or perhaps recognize they're on the precipice of something trending in a downward direction, do you have a an approach for people to check back in with themselves in a little bit more of an objective way, like a, I don't want to say a mantra or, you know, however you would maybe clinically describe it, but just a, a way to check back in and be more aware of where you are in your mental health journey. Yeah. What we're trying to do there is be able to observe ourselves, right? So, so instead of like, I am miserable, I am scared. It's like, I am scared and I see that I'm scared. But the part of me that sees that I'm scared is, is not so scared that it can't see rationally, right? So I can see that mm -hmm. I'm scared, and then the part that's observing that, or I'm angry or whatever it may be, can can look at that instead of saying, oh, I'm angry and I'm ashamed of being angry. I'm angry and why am I angry? And why am I ashamed of that? Because that, that's how we start to problem solve because we can observe ourselves. And the series of, of uh, four podcasts on the uh, Huberman Lab in, in September that I did really kept talk about this, like what's going on inside of us and then it's, it speaks to how do we try and stop and take stock of ourselves and look at ourselves and, and be able to assess ourselves, even if it's just, oh, I write a little bit then. I talk to a friend then. I go for a walk and instead of running the same things over in my head, I'm looking around me and I'm letting myself think. I mean, th there's some simple ways we can do that. Sometimes we need more than simple ways. But I try to talk about that in that format so it kind of mm -hmm. leads people through. So that's what I would reference, I think, for an, uh, another resource. Yeah. It was an excellent uh, four segment uh, series, fantastic podcast uh, series, by the way. Yeah, it's it. Uh, we have nowhere near enough time to try to unpack those things. I would absolutely point people at those as well and to chip away at them as they could. You. From your from your clinical approach or what you've seen in your experience, would you say? And let's just talk maybe just the U.S. Would you say mental health is on the rise or decline? Oh my goodness, it's on the, it's on the decline. I can't imagine that it's anything different. That there's so many data points that tell us that the increasing distress in people, the increase in isolation, right? Not, not to one person isolated from all others, but the isolation of like how we believe, no matter what mm -hmm. someone thinks or believes, whether it's one point of view amongst a bunch of rational points of view, or it's a point of view that's entirely false. Like if I, if I want to think that one plus one is three, uh, but I can find a whole group of people who think that too. And, and, and now I don't have to go look at that anymore. 
Right? Then I just think one plus one is three. And if you start telling me it's two, well, then what's wrong with you? Like, I, I can't hear, right? I can't hear new perspectives. Yeah. And then we're, we're, we get much more defensive. So much of this has happened. I mean, the rise of interconnectedness in social media does help. Right? It helps through venues like this, where we're trying to get good information out to people. And there are a lot of other venues it helps. But there are a lot of ways in which it's done a lot of harm. And we have something that's powerful and not adequately understood and controlled that could do good and harm. The harm will outweigh the good unless we take control of it and make the good outweigh the harm. So I think our, our ways of communicating uh, the political situation, the pandemic, the wars, that, that things have gotten worse and we just have minimal resources absolutely minimal resources. You think about the things we spend money on. We spend millions of dollars because there's some, somebody's a political argument with someone else. And, you know, now there's a bunch of things going on to fact find something everybody knew the answer to anyway. Just one example. Right? We, we spend money on so many things, but we're not doing things like looking at our the bridges right, that are in disrepair. I mean, if there are giant barges going underneath bridges and there are pylons on both sides where if the barge hits the bridge, the bridge is going to fall over. The answer to that proposition is a bridge is going to be hit and fall over at some point. We know that. So why don't we go look at that? Why, why didn't we look and say, hey, that, that bridge in Baltimore is at risk? Or the, now we see other bridges are at risk. I see it in the news now. Are we going to do anything about it? Or is it easy to say, well, it's not happening now, right? Just like it's easy to say, congratulations for your military service. Good luck. Instead of saying, that's not right. right? What, do we, yeah. what do we have that's more important to put resources in? Right? Why don't we go look at every bridge, the safety of every road, the health of everyone who helps take care of us is well, it costs billions of dollars. Well, what are we wasting billions of dollars on? We got things more important than that? Not much. What? Do, not that this is possible, but what do you think the impact on mental health would be if social media platforms got shut off? I mean, it's like all of them or, or in a selective way? Well, I, it was it about a month ago. I think uh, Facebook was shut off for about, a, I don't know, four hours. And I think Instagram was associated with it. And people were losing their minds. And for me, I was like, oh, this is great. I don't have to be on my phone. Right. <laughs> I'm just curious what you think. I, I don't think that human human species is capable of evolving at the velocity that these platforms are and the interconnectivity that you talked about. We have access to untapped information. Largely, it's like an 80-20 anecdotally negative to positive. It's this compare and contrast. Look at me, look at me, look at me. This And it's just, I just, I'm wondering... If it was all to shut off, I mean, obviously, we'd have to deal with the chaos and people thinking their life was upended. I, I tend to think, though, that the net the net of it would be quite positive. Yeah, I have to agree with that. Why? Because I think now the, the net of it being there is quite negative, even though there's so yeah. many good things. Right. But because it's uncontrolled and then and then it, it's easier to destroy than create. This is a, this is a human story. Right? It takes a long time to build a building. They knock it down very, very quickly. So so. It's much easier then to use any powerful tool to destroy, to be destructive than it is to create. And that is true of social media too. So yes, it would, I think it would be true. If we shut it all off, it would be net positive. But that's again, shame on us as a society for it being that way to start with, right? And think about the short-term view of things where we're saying if people are looking too much at this week's or this month's you know, results of health for a company, or hey, I'm surviving now, and, and that, that's got to be good. I'll survive next month instead of thinking I can't survive this for another year. And so, so this has been a growing problem, the, ability, the inability to defer gratification, project into the future, more of like I, I, I want or need something now. And so, so think about what you said. Facebook gets shuts off for a day. People are like, don't know what to do. Hey, that is way too much need for immediate gratification. I mean, think about how that speaks to what we're talking about. And we need to like, whoa, whoa, stop. You know, let's get back to basic principles of how we're living our lives and how we're looking to feel good. Because if you're feeling good because of things that are happening in the moment, right, in the moment, then you're not thinking ahead. And it's interesting. So people then often don't feel good because something is turned off. We see this when there's an outage of one of the news sources or this or that. But you just described uh, what comes into us by and large, like from news sources, so it's like 80, 20 or, or more negative. So now I'm upset that I don't have a free flow of the thing that's hurting me. I want a free flow of it because it's distracting me. This is why people talk about addiction, you know, internet addiction or shit. And it's not something special. Like the thing not to do and what medicine wants to do is that's something new and special. No, there's addictive machinery inside of us 
that prioritizes the short term over the long term. Like, why does the person who's an alcoholic and knows that alcohol is hurting and killing them drink, right? Because it will it will soothe when they put the bottle up to them. It will soothe in the short term. They know, know that, but don't have a better solution. So, so you look at what's in the short term at the expense of the long term. Isn't that what we're talking about? I want my 80-20 negative news. I'm mad I don't have it, even though it's hurting me. We have yeah. the insight into what's going on inside of us, then we can handle things much, 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 much better, including and maybe most importantly with social media, because I don't think we understand how much time this short term view, recruiting addictive machinery, losing the long term perspective. We don't understand how much it hurts us. But I think when a barge hits a bridge and it falls down and we realize, oh, that would have been preventable. But it would have taken a lot of time, attention, prioritization, money, but we didn't do it. Then we think, hey, what's going on with us? Do we need to make a, a full stop and look at how we're living as a society, how we're projecting forward? Because we're getting worse and worse at it. Even people choosing a leader for X number of years. I mean, isn't it a danger that, say, in the presidential race, we choose a leader for the, who's going to lead for four years, but most people's view of their lives is now pushed down, not anywhere near four years. Like just yeah. fundamentally, how do you make a good decision four years in the future when you can't see more than this year, right? So so it's clearly bad. I think there's not, there's no opinion. I think, I mean, anyone can have an opinion about anything, but how can it, how could it be okay to not be able to think as far ahead as you're making decisions? Right? So I, I think it's very, very clear. We have to change things. We have already made great peril for ourselves and and, and people get hurt and killed all the time because of the peril that I'm talking about. Most recently, you know, people driving over a bridge or working on a bridge could kill it. It's horrifying and predictable and avoidable. And it's a symptom of a societal sickness that I think we can change where we go back to the basic principles of how are we taking care of ourselves, including our mental health? Am I curious about what's going on inside of me? Right? What role might what I'm doing now, how might, might it be related to things that are in my head from when I'm a kid? If I'm saying that thing in my head doesn't matter because I was a kid, why the hell is it still in my head when I'm an adult? Right? So, yeah. you know, we start being more honest with ourselves, honesty and curiosity, and we avoid a lot of problems, whether it's the veteran who starts drinking because they're difficult thoughts and memories inside and there's not a team feeling to deal with it and there's too much time for it, you know, then then we'll do that better. You know, all, so from the individual person through to, you know, maybe we should take care of the bridges better because guess what happens if we don't do anything? Eventually, another barge runs into a bridge and knocks it over. Then we go, ah, oh. you know, until the next one happens. I mean, it's not acceptable, and we can change it. In the decades you've been practicing, how much has the approach to mental health shifted, or has it largely stayed the same? Oh, it's, it's gotten very clearly worse. Much, much more focus on the short term. But even the idea that it doesn't actually matter where the symptoms are coming from. Let's just get an inventory of the symptoms and, and and give you something for them. How could it be that you can have psychiatrists who have hundreds and hundreds of people on a, a, a power? They don't, how do you know people if they're that many hundreds of people and you have 15 minute appointments with them? I mean, what that looks like is you come into my office, I don't know you, even if I'm a good doctor, like I can't know you, I can't know all these uh, thousands of people. And then yeah. I, I can't get to know you and what's going on inside of you all, I would, all people are doing then is symptom inventory. Oh, wait, your mood is lower. Let's give you an antidepressant, right? You're not sleeping. Let's give you sleeping medicine instead of saying, why is your mood lower? Let's understand you, right? Human time costs more than medicines. There's a reason that we use roughly four to five times as much medicine as, say, the Dutch. Right? There's, there's a culture of greater responsibility there, greater responsibility for yourself. You come in and you say, I'm 30 pounds overweight, my cholesterol is high, my blood pressure is high. You know what happens in America? An overworked physician who's like, oh, I got to treat all this because here's your prescription for depression, here's your prescription for cholesterol, here's a prescription for blood pressure. Whereas in other systems where they're, they're looking more at the people, the thought is, here's what you need to do, right? And then often there's support mechanisms. You, gotta, you have to eat better, you have to exercise, but we're not going to fix it with the medicine because if you fix it with the medicine, the person then you'll fix the problem and the problem is still there, right? The medicine maybe helps the cholesterol come down, but they're still not taking care of themselves. Then it goes back up anyway. I mean, it's predictable, right? But we don't look, we're so short-sighted and that's so true in terms of 
mental health. Like we don't want to invest, for example, time health systems in the therapy for people because it costs money to go see the therapist. So then, well, you can see a therapist through the health plan. Yeah, there's nobody on the panel that has openings, right? It takes two months to find a person, but then you find a person, you authorize X number of sessions. You know why? Because it's all cost savings. But then the person's going into the ER, right? Or, the, or it's even in the hospital once. Okay, you saved by being short-sighted, you saved it three, four thousand dollars, didn't send in the therapy, right? That, that one ER visit cost twenty thousand, right? But so even if we don't look at humans, because like the humans matter, right? But if we just thought about money and got the health systems, can you just think about money, the thing that you're concerned with, but don't think of it this far out? The health systems would take better care of people, but the systems don't do that. People don't stay with the systems a long time. The employers are paying for health care and employees don't stay forever now. But really, it's just the same pool of people, right, from one job to another, or one insurer to another, and, and no one's paying attention to the long term. Then we start sounding a lot like there's a, Idiocracy is a movie, right, where there's there is um, there's healthcare where the person's like on a conveyor, right? And they just go and say things at the other end, they get a medicine. You know, that movie was made as a, as a parody a, lo- a while ago. We're a lot closer to that than, than one might think. I mean, oftentimes that's a person's effective experience. No one says, get on the conveyor belt, say a bunch of things. By the time you're off it in 10 minutes, there'll be a bunch of pills in your hand. But that's kind of what's happening. Yeah. Dr. Conti, I want to be re- uh, respectful of your time and give you the the final word. And maybe we could leave for the, for people out there who are resistant to the idea of even taking a sounding of the depth of their own mental health or people who don't know if they even need to look underneath the hood. Perhaps you could leave the audience with just your broad advice on creating an approach to, it, to something, in my mind at least, mental health that will lead to a much more fulfilling and enriching life. You have to go through the work and do the work, obviously, but um, just your thoughts on where people can start. Maybe they're not even sure whether or not they need it. Right, right. So there's just a couple of questions to answer. And here, what I'm trying to do is really reduce the simplicity. So there are questions we can ask ourselves. Like, am I happy with my life? Most people have a yes or no answer. If they have a no answer, there's something making them unhappy. It's not that everything makes them unhappy. So then you look at, okay, if your answer is no, or you're like, some things are good, some things are not. What are those things? And say, like, let's take stock of what they are. Let's ask questions. Is there anything I'm hiding from myself? It's remarkable how what the answer to that is very, very often yes. Is there anything mm-hmm. going on over and over in my mind that I'm not paying attention to? Are there things going really, really well in my life that I want more of? Are there things that are really weighing on me? These are simple questions we can ask ourselves. But here's the key. Ask yourself with curiosity, not with judgment. Or ask someone who will be curious with you. Like sometimes the answer could be even clergy because the thought is someone who's non-judgmental. Not that the clergy is supposed to be professional help, but someone can go and say, hey, here's this thing going on inside me, not feel fear of being shamed. Sometimes it's not that, but you know what I mean? Just with the sense of openness, like, oh, if there's something running over and over again in my head or I'm um, my 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, whatever it may be, and, you know, this thing from when I was a kid really comes to the surface every time I see X, you know, news that someone was in a car accident because it was a car accident back then or something like that. Like, let me just pay attention to that without the reflexive shame that leads us to hide it, which is why this compassionate curiosity, that's really the answer. There's really two words. Have compassionate curiosity for yourself. That's that's really the answer. There are a lot of different ways to do that. But part of having compassionate curiosity is accepting our humanness. We can all be overwhelmed you know, no one is stronger than the forces around us. And like, that's just true in human. And if we look at ourselves, we don't, don't, I say a lot, don't make yourself special in a bad way, right? In a negative way. Most people who think X isn't okay for me, it is not okay for me to feel this way. It's not okay for me to have depression after that loss, or it's not okay to me have intrusive thoughts about something I saw on the job, whatever the job may be. But if it were someone else, that that person would understand it would say, oh, I understand. Look at what you've been through. You need to talk about that. But not me. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm special yeah. in the way that I, I'm supposed to be better than that. No, it's not. That's, you know, that, that is making the self special in a way that is not good. We are all human. Extend yourself the same human courtesy. 
you with other people and then you can be compassionately curious about yourself and wherever that may lead you're off to the races i love it easier said than done i'm definitely uh guilty of giving people more grace than i am uh giving myself that grace that's a tough one that i have bounced up against many times yeah it's all, all this, the, the the things that are easiest easier said than done are, are still doable right but that's yes. where the work comes <laughs> in because it is easy yeah. to say it but the doing is different but that's that's where the work of it of it is right? but we've got to start with the ability to say it, right to see what what is that work and then to start trying it if people start treading in this ground and it's evoking a lot of shame there's something to look at from that right but just being okay with whatever comes up in ourselves giving us that freedom i can at least think whatever comes into my head like i can acknowledge that i'm thinking or feeling whatever is going on inside of me that's often the start and he said even that's easier said than done so let's give let's give people the guidance to get to the starting line and help to get you know to, to be to become off to the races that's how we do the harder part which is the doing of it I couldn't agree more. Dr. Conti, thank you so much for your time. And I really appreciate what you do professionally as well. I think it made such an immense impact in people's lives. Um, and I hope that people listening to this can take the first step, which I found to be for myself, the hardest one. You know, after that, it was actually yeah. quite easy. Yes. Yes. That's right. Take that first step. That's a, that's a wonderful, that's a wonderful message to end on. Absolutely. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I hope that it got you thinking. And more importantly, I hope that it gets you talking. And if you don't want to talk to somebody or you feel like you don't have anything to talk about, never be afraid to reach out to those that you love and care about because we never know what somebody is dealing with quietly. If you want to learn more about the world and work of Dr. Paul Conti, please check out drpaulconti.com. Uh, the link is down in the show notes. Thank you again for listening to Change Agents, an ironclad original presented by Montana Knife Company, and we will be back next week.